It sounded like a train coming right through the house. I could feel the house shaking. Pretty soon the cups were flying off the hooks. It was uh, three, four minutes of air. And somebody yelled, tidal wave. Then you could hear a deafening, deafening sound that something bad was going to happen. My eight-year-old said, Mom, should I pray? There was no way anybody was going to escape. The house lifted up. Then we took a wild, wild ride. He said it just opened up and everything fell in. And no mother thinks they're going to bury their kids. It was hard to fathom. What had happened had happened so fast. It's something that you never forget. You really don't get over it. Channel 2 News presents Unstable Ground. March 27, 1964. It's a day that the earth under Alaska shook so hard that not only is it inscribed in our history books, but the scars it inflicted on the land are still very much visible today. The 9.2 earthquake is the largest ever recorded in North America. It was so powerful it unleashed a series of giant tsunami waves that flattened coastal towns and villages. Between the intense shaking and the violent walls of water, more than 130 people were killed, including 17 in California and Oregon. It was Good Friday. For many Alaskans, it was a laid back start to the weekend. Because of the holiday, some people had the day off work. Others got off early. Most schools across Alaska were closed, so kids were at home. As the dinner hour approached, many of those kids began tuning into their favorite television show, Fireball XL5. <laughs> then at 5.36 in the afternoon, deep beneath Prince William Sound, a geological time bomb hundreds of years in the making unleashed its fury. The sound created by the initial shock waves were picked up on a recording system in a downtown Anchorage courtroom. The shaking intensified, shattering buildings, homes, and roads. For an entire generation of Alaskans, the ordeal is forever seared in their memories. And that's where we start with the stories of people from places like Chiniga, Kodiak, Valdez, Seward, and Anchorage. They were among those who saw and felt the wrath of the Good Friday earthquake. We had my seventh birthday party that day. As a birthday treat, Lori Gillum and her older sister headed to the Fourth Avenue Theater to watch The Sword and the Stone. The beginning of the movie, to me, is this book opening the picture, and then the wrath of God and the fire and brimstone of the sword being thrust into the stone. That's when the earthquake hit. And I'm going, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> then her sister started running, and Lori followed her out of the building. And I'm standing here with my popcorn. You know, and by that time it was, it was pretty shaky. But this is about where we stood. They clung to parking meters and watched 4th Avenue rise and fall. The road was going like this as we could watch the waves come down the road. The federal building seemed to roll with the waves. That flagpole was, was bouncing back and forth. The sidewalk separated from the road. There the girls stayed until their mother reached them. This was the letter that mom wrote to the family in Michigan. Their mother's account chronicled in 13 handwritten pages. In exactly 31 minutes, it'll be 72 hours since the earthquake hit our city. She had been shopping for groceries when the shaking began. From the time I realized it was the quake, it was a quake, I started leaving the store. I had only one thought to get to our girl to get to our girls from that movie. They were alone. She drove from Gamble and Ninth, the two-mile drive to the theater marked with destruction. I noticed the new Chrysler building, just rubble. Trucks crushed under cement walls that had fallen. The same was true for the unfinished Alaska Sales and Service Building. I started praying the Lord's Prayer, but I'd get confused, and I couldn't remember it all, as I saw more twisted buildings and wreckage. Among them, the newly built J.C. Penney building. Part of it collapsed and crushed a family friend. If it hadn't been snowing, I would have been in pennies on the second floor in the front of the building and consequently I wouldn't be writing this letter today. 
Surely as I write this, God let me, God let me away from the storm. The young mother made her way through downtown. She raced toward the theater, not sure what she would find. Glass filled the streets and mannequins hung out of the shop windows. We rounded the corner and there were our two girls standing on the sidewalk by the theater. Their backs to me, not saying a word, alone. I bent down and hugged and kissed them both. All three of us cried. That day, nine people in Anchorage were killed. Lori and her family were among the lucky ones. Yeah, it's here. The pictures spread out on this dining room table tell a story. There's a picture, there's one picture that shows the inside of that house. It's a story about a day filled with unimaginable horrors and a family that somehow overcame them. That's Robert, I think. Linda McSwain and Doug McCray are sister and brother, born and raised in Seward. On Friday, March 27, 1964, Linda, 15 years old at the time, was getting ready for a big weekend. I had just come from shopping. The prom was the next day, so I'd been downtown with my friends. Doug, whose wife had just given birth to their first child about a month earlier, was working at a paint and body shop. Got off work at, I think, early at 4 o'clock, and it was a, a quiet, calm day, which is kind of unusual. Before heading home, he stopped at his mother and father's house for a visit. That's when his unusually quiet, calm day began taking a turn. Mom had a china cabinet, I remember, and the, the, the cups hung in there. Well, that was kind of an indicator we were having a, you know, an earthquake, but pretty soon the cups were flying off the hooks. And it just didn't stop. It just got stronger and stronger and stronger. Doug ran home to get his wife and baby, then went back to his parents' home. It was about then when the first flames were spotted at the nearby tank farm. I remember my dad saying something like, you know, get what you need, you know, we're leaving in, in just a few minutes. Sadly, the most important things to me were my prom dress and all of my prom goodies. With the fires at the tank farm threatening the south end of Seward, the McCrays decided to head for safety. They piled into the family's red Corvair and drove the length of town north to the end of Resurrection Bay. That's where Doug McCray's in-laws lived. Their home was in a subdivision just over this way. They had left one life-threatening ordeal behind, but soon would come face to face with a much more menacing danger. And they hollered tidal wave. We heard that loud and clear. Dad, and Dad was hollering, we gotta get on the roof, we gotta get on the roof. And then you could hear a deafening, deafening sound that something bad was gonna happen. The first tsunami wave to hit Seward was between 30 and 40 feet high. Here come this wave through the trees, I mean, just like a freight train. It didn't look like water, it was just a wall of mud and trees in it. The wave slammed into the subdivision, flattening everything in its path. Our car went by us. Everything, when you picture a subdivision, that I don't know how many homes are in there, maybe 12 to 15 homes, everything in all these homes just floated by. But instead of being destroyed, the house the McCrays clung to began moving. The house lifted up. Uh, there must have been water in front of the wave and you could feel the plumbing and stuff tearing loose. Then we took a wild, wild ride spinning and bouncing off trees and worried about power lines and just all kinds of stuff. And we went, I'm just guessing maybe 300 yards. But we eventually um, just got jammed in, just hit real hard into this strand of trees and, um, and, and there we were. Throughout the night, more giant waves crashed ashore. Somehow, the house at the head of the bay remained upright and intact. You can see the insulation hanging down off here. And... When the sun rose the next morning and those violent waves subsided, the McRae family was finally able to come down from their perch on the roof. The subdivision where homes once stood was now filled with debris and mud. Much of their hometown of Seward suffered the same fate. There was over 200 houses totally damaged, I mean, and there was 90, I think, beyond repair. They were just gone, and all the industrial area was gone, which was 7th Avenue. It's, it's, I, it was hard to fathom uh, what, it, what had happened. It had happened so fast. 
But despite all the destruction, somehow that small house at the head of Resurrection Bay, whose roof was a haven for eight souls, somehow through it all, it stayed standing. I do think about that sometimes. Like, I wonder why, what did that mean? It's a question the family has pondered over the past 50 years. I just think it, it wasn't our time. And when I think of the pain and the suffering that, um, that a lot of people experienced in Seward, <laughs> we were very lucky. And so I, I think if, if anything like this changes you, it, it makes you pretty humble. I think I was numb for a long time. And those of us that live by the sea have to be on alert. March 27th, 1964 is a date Kodiak residents Arlene Skinner and Marion Johnson will never forget. Came over in front of the cabin and over the cliff. The 9.2 shaker rocked the island, but it was the tsunami that sent the town into a panic. And I, just like uh, there was an invisible giant and the house went boom, boom, boom. Arlene was with her 18-month and 2-month-old babies at the time. She was cooking fried chicken when the earthquake hit. The ground was rolling. It was like waves. And at one point, the ground was so swollen that I remember looking at it, and I was so afraid it was going to crack open because I could just feel the pressure. So I don't know how, to this day, I don't know how I got outside, but I just know I, when I kind of came to, I was holding both my babies. On the other side of Kodiak, Marion was dropping her husband and son off at the airport. In the car, her three kids, eight, three, and six months old. And I thought, oh darn, it's not a flat, it's an earthquake. Both Marion and Arlene raced back to their homes with their children, but that plan quickly changed. I turned on the radio and they said, go to high ground. Now, it was probably stupid to have tried to come home when you live by the ocean, but I wasn't thinking of tsunamis. I didn't know about tsunamis, but I certainly do now. I was standing there and all of a sudden I could see the wall of water. It was high and it was, it was like a wall. It was at the end and the water was churning. I grabbed a couple of things because of the baby and then realized I could not get off the property because the bridge had gone and the first wave had come in but we couldn't get out. The water had already risen that fast. Drawers were thrown open, toilet water was removed. We'd have this big jolt again and people would start running out and running up the steps. A second higher wave did show up, prompting the two mothers to figure out a better way of escape. So I told my husband, he should take my daughter and I'll keep the baby and we'll just meet at the top, whatever. I was very calm, very quiet. Uh, my eight-year-old said, Mom, should I pray? And I said, sure, that was my David. Subsequent waves never made it to where Marion and Arlene's families were. But 50 years later, the memories are still vivid and the fears remain. In Kodiak, the tsunami warning system is part of everyday life. Do you hear the sirens when they go off on Wednesdays? Oh, yes. They're right up the hill. So you hear them, what do you, do you think about Oh, I get out of here. If I was in an area that didn't have a, a high bank, I would start getting my anxiety, my chest would get tight, and I'd get anxious, I'm going to go. You just don't quite get over it, I guess. 19 people on islands in the Kodiak region were killed that day, and memories haunt many who survived. And we're just very lucky to be alive and to be safe. This is your Gospel Radio Voice in the North, KJNP, AM and FM, North Pole, Alaska. Hundreds of miles away from the epicenter of the quake, Bonnie Carriker lives and works as a volunteer for a Christian radio station. I practice what I preach. She's carrying out the mission she and her husband started so many years ago in Valdez. Dwayne and Bonnie Carriker were starting a church in the community. 
Dwayne worked at the docks as a longshoreman to supplement the family's income. That's where he was when the earth started shaking. Bonnie was home with the couple's two children. And I thought my washing machine was uh, out of balance or something, and but I realized soon that it wasn't. It sounded like a train coming right through the house. And I got the two kids and we sat on the floor and watched the floor look like an ocean's wave. To escape a possible tidal wave, Bonnie and the kids stayed at a friend's house further inland. Bonnie didn't know where Duane was, but she assumed he was doing what he did best. My husband was the type of person who would go and help people. She later learned Duane became one of the victims. Then they came and told us the truth, you know, which was that the dock was completely gone. But the man up in the crow's nest, where they where he controlled the crane that brought the quit the stuff off of the ship onto the dock. He said that there was no way anybody was going to escape. He said it just opened up and everything fell in. Like so many lost that day, Dwayne's body was never recovered. Dwayne was very accomplished, a good singer, a good preacher. <laughs> He's he was, he was a special man. In 50 years, Bonnie never remarried. I don't think I could find anybody that would uh, take the place of him, you know, that's, and I never did. She and her two small children resettled in North Pole. I, I remember, I think about it, sometimes dream about it. You know, it's, uh, it's something that you never forget. Bonnie resumed the work she and her husband began in Valdez. The current temperature here in North Pole is 31 degrees above zero. In North Pole, far away from any ocean, she helped build the Christian radio and television station. I think this is the reason, KJNP. I was instrumental in helping get started. The tower behind the station, like Bonnie's life's work, is dedicated to Duane. I don't uh, understand how anybody can handle such a severe thing without knowing the Lord. What she's helped build, Bonnie says, is a solace, perhaps a reason for losing her husband. I knew God made the world. I, they couldn't convince me he didn't. For 10,000 years, the bounty of the Prince William Sound sustained the people of the Chinega tribe. They settled on the southern tip of this island and called it the village of Chinega, which means beneath the mountain. We played football on the beach, baseball, hide and seek. They had a school and a church, but no television or phone. For food, they relied on the waters. And Dad used to say that when the tide goes out, the table is set. They also relied on each other. We were isolated, but we weren't alone. In 1964, the island was home to 78 people. We were good to everybody. We were good to each other. I mean, very seldom was anybody ugly to anybody. Avis Komkoff was a young mother of three. Joanne, her eldest, was three and a half years old. Avis remembers the little girl asking to go to grandma's that day. Because I heard that voice tell me, send her home. Timmy Solanoff was 12 and playing on the beach. I was all the way to the end, on the big boulders where you're not supposed to be. Suddenly, everything began to shake. Can't even stand up. I'm trying to walk on jello. That's what it feels like. Then a deafening roar as he scrambled up the embankment. I always try to figure out how did I get away from that big wave. Timmy says a higher power protected him. I was alone, but I wasn't alone. Safe on higher ground, he saw the water come in three separate waves, smashing houses and boats. He saw people running, struggling, people he knew. Brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nephews, nieces. Then I could feel the house shaking. Avis grabbed her sons and went outside. We were just standing there looking and somebody yelled, tidal wave. So we turned around and ran up. I lost my s slippers running in the snow because the snow was deep yet. Anyone who could fled to the school on higher ground. 
And we walked up to the mountain there, you know, up and everybody's kind of gathering everything, trying to see who made it, who didn't. I've seen the whole village. I've seen the whole village just getting blasted up. What the people of Chiniga had spent centuries building was gone within minutes. It was uh, three, four minutes of terror. As he made his way down the mountain, Timmy called for help. I jumped to my dad, probably 15, 12, 15 feet. And he whispered in my ear, you see buttons are gula. Timmy's three-year-old sister and one-year-old brother were gone, along with more than a third of the village, including Joanne. She died with my mom and dad, her grandma and grandpa. I, I, to this day, I'll never know why I sent Joanne home, except I heard that voice, send her home. I mean, no mother thinks they're gonna bury their kids before them. Uh, we lost 26 of them. And uh, I just don't like to say there's 26 of them because uh, we know just every one of them, so. And uh, it was very hard. Larry Evanoff was in Wrangell that day in boarding school. The principal called the 15-year-old to the office. Is, uh, <clears throat> both your parents are gone, your uncle and aunt are gone. I said, Mom can't be gone. I just got a package from her in the, in the mail. Well, I was way down. I was scraping the bottom. I, I was hurting. Most of the hurting was in here. His elders told him to finish out the school year, so it wasn't until weeks later that Larry went back home to what was left of Chinika. Just being there for the first time, I guess, knowing that so many people were not around anymore, and uh, it just, you know, paralyzed me, I guess you could go. I could hardly walk, felt like my feet were way to ton. Crews found a few bodies. They found my old, my oldest girl, Joanne, a couple weeks later on Knight's Island. The doctor wouldn't let me um, identify her. He knew her, but he told them, no, I know who she is. They just brought her little T-shirt and her cross down, and I kept them. But most of the bodies were never recovered. As far as mom and dad know, they never did find them. There was no closure. There was Still no closure. <laughs> then my heart hurt so bad I I had to I had to let it go. It was hurting too hard. You really don't get over it. It's just always gonna be in your head, in your heart, in your soul. Timmy wondered too why they had been taken and he had been spared. I guess he just took I just figured he just took all the good people that should be taken care of, you know. Larry holds out hope that he will find some sign of his loved ones. And I won't quit looking. One day I'll find something. <laughs> Decades later, some of the survivors relocated to land about 15 miles south to what is now called Chinika Bay. Every year, they gather at the original village site in remembrance of those lost on what they call the day that cries forever. And I used to have dreams about the end of the world. You know, the big cloud, big black cloud coming and we're on an island, me and I don't know who all was there. And we'd all be running to get away from that cloud and then we'd get to the end of the island and just before that black cloud got to us, I'd wake up. Chiniga and Valdez moved to safer ground. But next on Unstable Ground, we'll tell you about a decision Anchorage made for one especially hard-hit neighborhood. And there are numerous fault lines crisscrossing Alaska, so which one is most likely to produce the next major earthquake? Well, if you live in the Matsu Valley, it could hit close to home. 
The 1964 earthquake was 900 years in the making. That's how long pressure was building up along a major fault line that runs mainly under the ocean south of Alaska's shore. Channel 2's Lacey Grossfold explains what created the second most powerful earthquake in recorded history. To understand what happened, it's important to know what was going on under the surface. Peter Heusler is a research geologist for the U.S. Geological Survey. He studies the history of active faults. On the surface of the Earth, there's these, these plates that uh, kind of move with respect to each other. And the reason that they're moving is basically it's hot in the center of the Earth and it's cold on the outside. And that heat from the middle of the Earth wants to get out somehow. In the five decades since, scientists have used the 1964 earthquake to better understand Alaska's unstable ground. The Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks is the headquarters for earthquake research in Alaska. Uh, what we're looking at here. State seismologist Michael West studies earthquakes in Alaska. Scientists now know the 1964 earthquake was caused by a buildup of pressure between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate that converge along the Aleutian chain. And when that happened, a, uh, a piece of that uh, interface between the two plates began to rupture beneath Prince William Sound. Much like ripples from a pebble thrown into a pond, that rupture caused the Earth's crust to move in waves. They are waves in every sense uh, of the word. The epicenter in the middle of Prince William Sound rippled along the subduction zone, an area about 500 miles long and 150 miles wide. The earth shook, the ground undulating, for four and a half minutes. There was uh, one sort of large area that slipped in southern Prince William Sound, which was that kind of first pulse of shaking. And then um, there was another area offshore Kodiak Island. It measured 9.2 on the moment magnitude scale. Experts say the force of that shake was greater than the energy of 63,000 atomic bombs. The earth rang like a bell, sinking boats in Louisiana and moving water and wells all the way in South Africa. In 50 years, no earthquake has matched it in size. In Alaska, the land sank in some places. In others, it rose. The barnacle encrusted shoals that were lifted above the water, the ghost forests of Turnigan and Kinnick Arm, where waters, where lands subsided beneath water. The shaking caused landslides in Turnigan, where the soil failed. Tremendous amounts of sediments pour out of the mountains through erosion and fill these bays with lots of loose, uh, unconsolidated, really muds. The soil failure underwater led to a type of tsunami that happens almost immediately. Valdez and Chiniga were wiped out by local tsunamis. The second type of tsunami, regional tsunamis, began in the ocean and reverberated to coastal towns, killing 17 people in Oregon and California. Yes, after the 1964 event, uh, Congress authorized the creation of an Alaska tsunami warning system and we were developed to be a quick response center. So when the earth begins to shake, the center alerts coastal residents to run for higher ground. As you just heard, local tsunamis were caused by soil sliding during the shaking. Soil very much like the kind found here in the Turnigan area of West Anchorage. When the soil is violently shaken by an earthquake, the strength and duration of the Good Friday quake, the soil is basically turned into a liquid and becomes very unstable. In 64, many homes here in the Turnigan area were lost to landslides. And when it came time to rebuild, many said this area was still too dangerous. But after years of debate, the city gave approval for new homes to be built here. The uh, homestead cabin was over here in what is now Linary Park. On that day, instead of driving to his front door in Turnigan, Brooke Marston had to climb down to reach his wife and children. So I had to go back and get a rope, tie it to a tree and climb over the side of the bluff. My house, which was the original homestead cabin, was at about a 45 degree angle. 
To Marston, there was no question. He wanted to rebuild and turn again. This is, this is where we wanted to live, wanted to raise our children. Others wanted to move. After the quake, residents considered jacking up all the houses in Turnigan and moving them. It would be impossible. It would have killed the town as far as uh, uh, my uh, feeling is. The quake caused what would be in today's dollars almost $3 billion worth in damage. The latest move to uh, reconstruct Alaska. Alaska's lawmakers looked to Washington for recovery money. A big, big job. Pretty big bunch of money. Marston rebuilt using a loan from federal aid funds. Before construction, he needed permission from Washington, D.C. After receiving the telegram giving him the go-ahead, he started work immediately. Got a backhoe and I'm down in the, in the hole right here. He was digging his foundation when a man in a tie came by the job site. When people with a shirt, white shirt and a tie come on a construction job, you know that trouble is there. The man told Marston to stop construction. He said, we just got the revised telegram and it said, subject to the approval of the Corps of Engineers. And I said, well, it's now subject to my mortgage and I've made the first draw. Marston kept building and kept detailed documentation of his progress. Nothing more was said. It was that grit that led many to rebuild in Anchorage right after the quake. Well, I don't want you to raise a lot of hue and cry at the public about there might be some instability to Captain Cook. Walter Hickel, who was elected Alaska's governor two years after the quake, broke ground for Hotel Captain Cook before the geotechnical studies were finished. The hotel laid its foundation atop a graben, or crack, caused by the shaker. The building was engineered to move with the unstable ground. And you don't stop the world because you had an earthquake. And you can design for them, and this town has been well designed. I think the Anchorage Westward is a perfect example. The Groton came right through that corner. Marston says Hickel and those like him saved the town. He keeps the newspaper article on the study that declared his neighborhood safe. So the houses were not moved, the L Street apartments were not moved, and uh, people went on with their lives. There we go, that's last night's earthquake. Those who study earthquakes say the worst ground often has the best view. And it's very, very tempting to want to build uh, in those locations. And that's a recipe for disaster. Oh, I still think it's a good place to live. But to the people who rebuilt, it's a risk they're willing to take. So how well will places like Anchorage and the Matsu Valley stand up to the next powerful earthquake? In the 50 years since the Good Friday earthquake, engineers have learned a lot about making our homes and buildings stronger. But some say more needs to be done. That's next on unstable ground. Scientists say it's not a matter of if, but when the next major earthquake will strike Alaska. Since 1964, scientists have discovered even more fault lines running through the state. But there's one in particular that's perhaps getting more attention than the others, mainly because that fault line isn't very far from where we're standing right now. Denali is the product of thousands of years of geological activity. The same fault that produced North America's greatest mountain ruptured in 2002, creating a magnitude 7.2 shake. Straddling the Denali Fault, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And when that large earthquake happened in 2002, not a single drop of oil was spilled. And I think this was a landmark success that shake was powerful, but far away from populated centers. Another fault line, however. So the Castle Mountain Fault is sort of like a little brother to the, the bigger Denali Fault. Runs through the Matsu, one of the fastest growing regions in the state. There's other areas that are uh, sort of these concentric shape um, features here. State geologist Richard Kaler says Castle Mountain Fault bears signs of movement. One such sign, abrupt elevation differences called scarps. The scarps on the Castle Mountain range from uh, anywhere from a meter to about five meters high. Kaler says there's evidence at the fault line of a magnitude 7 earthquake within the last 10,000 years. If there is a periodicity to these big earthquakes, then we're kind of entering the window of time in which you might actually expect there to be another significant earthquake on that fault. Experts say even a magnitude 6 shaker from Castle Mountain could cause major damage. It's nice and quiet down in here and don't have a lot of problems. That fault line runs through Tammy Bowman's yard. As soon as I see that start dancing, oh, 
It's like, okay, what is it? As soon as we see that, we know it's not just a truck going past. Her home sits off a side road outside of Houston. Tammy didn't know the fault ran through her property when she bought the place until the region was hit about 10 years ago with an earthquake. And it raised the edge of this house in that corner over there 10 inches and just kept rolling through like this. Tammy is among dozens living on the fault line. More people are moving into the area, so we asked the Matsu borough officials what are their earthquake codes. So for a residential, we, it's, it's pretty simple, we don't have any. So there's a pretty strong uh, feeling of uh, private property rights, and um, as of yet, we, the political will to adopt building codes is just not there. But the borough is working on an emergency plan for any major event that might hit the area. USGS studies show some of the soil around the fault could slide during a quake. Emergency officials say that information is available, but Valley residents rarely ask for it. We're due for an earthquake. While it wasn't in Tammy's plan to live on a fault line. I more bought it, the house because the river's in the backyard. <laughs> and it's a beautiful spot. The location, she says, is worth the risk for now. In the past five decades, there have been many advances in making homes and buildings stronger to withstand earthquakes. Some of the credit goes to city governments that enacted stricter building codes. But recently, the Anchorage Assembly made a decision that critics claim is a step backwards. Channel 2's Grace Chang has the story. So when a house does start shaking, it won't slide off the foundation. Andre Spinelli says his family-run business has built thousands of earthquake-resistant houses. But he and dozens of other developers say the city gets in the way of building quickly, especially during the short construction season. In my opinion, I think it's strictly because of the backlog that happens at the Municipality Building Safety Department. Sharon Walsh is with the city's building safety department. The reason we're here is to protect the public's health, safety, and welfare. The, the attitude of the department is generally very adversarial. Assembly member Adam Trombley says the building safety department creates unnecessary roadblocks for the construction industry. Two years ago, assembly member Adam Trombley said developers who want to build single family and two family houses like the ones behind me shouldn't have to go through the city. He said they should be given the option of hiring someone outside of the city to sign off on their plans. The proposal was immediately criticized. If the contractor hires a reviewer to review plans that he's building, there's no independent independency to the review. City building officials and geotechnical advisors say the law could foster corruption. When the reviewer is being paid directly by the person who's desiring the approval, there's an implication of bias. In late September of 2012, despite concerns, the assembly passed the law anyway. But hey, look, uh, the people's representatives passed this thing 11 to 0. In the past year, dozens of homes were built using the new option. We have a reputation at stake, and we definitely don't want to be the, get the reputation of the company that got caught cheating on their blueprints or, you know, ab abusing some uh, ability to, you know, use a different plan review option. Developers and building officials agree Anchorage residents deserve safe housing, but disagree on who should sign off on the building plans. How safe is your neighborhood? Anchorage is divided up into five different zones. The higher the zone number, the more unstable the ground. As for the rest of the state, fault lines are mapped out, but these are only the fault lines scientists know about. See what experts say about the stability of your community at ktuu.com. What if a major earthquake strikes while kids are at school? Will our children and teachers be safe? We asked Channel 2's education reporter Corey Allen Young to investigate. Preparing for the next big one is routine for Alaska schools. The drills are top priorities for districts from Fairbanks to the Matsu to Kodiak. All of our schools are set up with shelters. We've spent money to make sure that uh, we have uh, emergency generators. 635 miles away in Sitka, earthquake and tsunami readiness is part of the overall emergency plan in Mount Edgecombe. Just last year, a sizable earthquake shook the town. Those kind of things um, make you realize that it is important to be prepared, and that's why we take our, our planning very seriously. In Anchorage, the school in Government Hill was destroyed, split in half. Fifty years later, the Anchorage School District says there have been improvements. Uh, although no building 
can survive against every known earthquake threat. You can rely on Anchorage School District facilities to uh, be among the, the most survivable in the entire community. Mike Abbott is in charge of building safety for Anchorage schools. Virtually any building built um, uh, more than 40 years ago will need some level of retrofitting. Uh, and depending on the original design, it might need a little or it might need a lot. Clark Middle School is a good example. Its old building needed to be completely torn down and rebuilt. Abbott says it was less expensive than retrofitting. The district is currently working on a similar project in Girdwood. School officials have a list of older schools that need work, like Airport Heights, Central, Inlet View, Gladys Wood, Greening, Turnigan, Mountain View, and Rabbit Creek. Last time schools were closed because of Good Friday, but the next time around, we might not be as lucky. Every time there's an earthquake, scientists learn valuable information. But coming up next on Unstable Ground, we'll tell you why they're not able to learn all that they could. There's little doubt that Alaska's built on unstable ground. In the five decades since the Good Friday earthquake, scientists have learned volumes about earthquakes. A lot of that information comes from a sophisticated string of instruments that monitor seismic activity. But that system may not be living up to Ago, this is how scientists measured earthquakes. Recording and sharing data took weeks, sometimes months. We've come a long way since then. What happens now, of course, is this happens almost instantaneously. Thanks to high-speed internet and modern technology, we have that information within seconds. These are seismometers that this is the actual instruments that measure the shaking of the ground. Anchorage is home to a sophisticated network made up of dozens of these seismometers. They're on the ground and bolted to bridges and buildings throughout the bowl. The instruments measure how the structures react when the earth shakes. We get data in real time. John Power is the lead scientist at the Alaska Volcano Observatory, which maintains the network for the U.S. Geological Survey. Anchorage is one of the most heavily instrumented urban areas in the country in terms of the number of seismometers. Each instrument costs federal taxpayers between $1,000 to $30,000. Installing them costs thousands more. While the seismic network is expensive and high-tech, it also has problems. Um, sadly, some of our instrumentation is not, not currently operational because of long-term um, declines in our funding. Records show at any given time about a quarter of the seismometers are not working. It, uh aggravates me. John Aho spearheaded the effort to install the network back in the 90s. We have a multi-million dollar system in uh, probably the most dense seismic uh, instrumentation, free field instrumentation system in the country and it, it aggravates me that we can't keep all the instruments working. So what exactly do we lose when these seismometers are down? Information from the instruments is used for what's called shake maps, which are used to help search and rescue crews reach victims. It also helps design more efficient buildings, which are currently built to California codes. The purpose of the network initially was to try to fine tune those for specific to Anchorage. Buzz Shear is part of a group that informs the city of earthquake hazards in Anchorage. Seismometer information helps decide whether to let people back into a building after an earthquake. These kind of records will help expedite um, re-entry or reuse of critical facilities. But first the instruments need to be working. Power says we can expect to see a new batch of these seismometers next year through a grant from the National Science Foundation. Meanwhile, Shearer says he and other engineers are trying to get money to fix and maintain the ones we currently have, instead of relying on scientists from California to do the job. Right now we don't have a method for predicting when an earthquake will occur. But in some countries, like Japan, they've implemented something called an earthquake warning system. It gives people a few seconds to prepare for an earthquake heading their way before the shaking begins. Installing such a system here in Alaska would cost about $80 million. One of the biggest problems first responders had in 1964 was being able to reach stricken communities. That's because many of the bridges leading to towns were destroyed. So how well will our road system stand up to another major shock? Nobody, nobody knows. Nobody is anybody's guess. Joey Yang is professor at UAA. He teaches geotechnical engineering. You know, most likely you're going to, there's going to be some major damages, you know, 
induced on this bridge. Yang says the design of bridges currently standing does not sufficiently account for what happens during Alaska's long winters, the freezing and thickening of the soil. Whatever is embedded in the soil, frozen soil, is likely going to be damaged. So when the foundation is damaged, the bridge is gone. The Alaska State Department of Transportation says 96 bridges throughout Alaska are structurally deficient. About a third of those bridges were built before 1964. But Yang says when bridges were built isn't as important as how and whether the freeze-thaw cycle was taken into account. That's unique to Alaska, and if we don't care, take care of this question, nobody else will. The state is currently working on fixing the worst of the bridges. Getting to all of them will take time and money. In our final segment of Unstable Ground, we remember the victims of the 1964 earthquake. She died with my mom and dad, her grandma and grandpa. I, I, to this day, I'll never know why I sent Joanne home, except I heard that voice, send her home. Towns that were hit by 1964, men are not off the hook by any means. You just don't quite get over it, I guess. I was way down. I was scraping the bottom. I, I was hurting. Most of the hurting was in here. of our special report is to look back at a significant event in our state's history and to ask the questions, what have we learned since then, and are we prepared should another strong earthquake strike here? It is a fact that Alaska is the most seismically active region in North America. According to the Alaska Earthquake Information Center, between 50 and 100 earthquakes occur across our state every single day. Most are so small we don't even feel them. But to be sure, the potential for another catastrophic earthquake, like the one that rocked Alaska 50 years ago, exists. When and where it will strike, no one can predict. But by being prepared, we can minimize the impacts. After all, dealing with earthquakes is part of life in Alaska, a place located on unstable ground. For all of us here at Channel 2 News, thanks for watching.